Well, good morning. Uh, good, good morning, Facebook um, family, friends, uh, all of you who are watching uh, live. And uh, it is so good to have you with us today. Uh, I just want to encourage you that if you are watching and as you are watching, uh, that you don't be uh, afraid to share what you're seeing, uh, because when you share the uh, sermon, the message, it has a far further reach. Uh, I hope and I pray that there is something that is said today that would be uh, beneficial to those who are lost, those of you who are hurting, uh, those of you who are facing various trials and temptation. And there may be somebody within your Facebook feed that would see that and uh, be um, helped by that and maybe even ultimately saved to the glory of God. Uh, also, uh, comment. Don't be afraid to comment. Tell us where you're watching from. It'd be interesting to see uh, how far our service did go this morning. Uh, but nonetheless, I'm just so glad that you're stopping to watch what we're doing today. I also want to say, stick with me. Uh, we've got a lot of ground to cover, but fortunately, as God told Moses, this is holy ground. So we're going to be covering this, and I don't have the unique uh, time frames that we normally do on Sunday morning, so I'm going to take my liberty to cover the area that I need to cover in Scripture. But we're going to be reading today in John chapter 11. If you want to grab your copy of your Bible and read along with us, we're going to be John chapter 11. We as a church, uh, this may be the first time you've ever tuned in, uh, I don't know, but we as a church uh, have been walking through the book of John uh, for almost a year now, uh, verse by verse, chapter after chapter. And it's been amazing to see the growth that is happening, not only in my own personal life and my own per through my own personal study, getting ready for these sermons, but also the growth of our church because we have been able to see God's faithfulness through this. And what we will see today um, is amazing to me because I did not plan this. Actually, I did plan this out. I planned to preach this text even as early as December of last year. This Sunday was slotted for this text. But yet it's amazing. I had no idea that the coronavirus would put us in this situation. But I do know that God has this sermon ordained for now. And this is amazing. And we will deal with that as we go along. John chapter 11 Verse 1, the Bible said, Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with the ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But Jesus heard it, and he said, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified. I'm going to read just that far, and I'm going to pray, and we're going to get into the sermon, and we'll cover the remainder until verse 44. Master Heavenly Father, we thank you for this unique opportunity I know that this is odd, this is awkward for some, especially those who are of us who are here and I'm preaching to a camera and to a few that are here. But Father, I know that you are using this for your glory. There are churches all over this nation today that have had to forced to be in this position, but I, I see that you are spreading your church in this manner. I, I see that you are taking your seed and casting it across this nation. And so, Father, I pray that you work in the hearts of the hearers today. I pray that you remove my fingerprints from this sermon and that only things that come out of my mouth is thus says the word of God. So I pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus and the church types. Amen, I guess. So we're going to look at the remainder of this chapter almost. We're going to go to verse 44. But it's important that we realize that up until this point, and even the, with the closing of chapter 10, is the ending of Jesus' ministry to the Jews. Jesus' public ministry his public ministry is over. Now, chapter 11 through 
chapter 18, we see that Jesus gives this time. He sets it aside for his disciples. Remember that Jesus came to die for the lost. He came to save those who are lost and give us reconciliation to the Father. But more so, he came to build his church. When he left here, he left not only uh, um, with us hopeless and just a few saved, but he left a plan in place that men would carry up, that, pick up that mantle and expand his church across the nations. God's church, the Big C Church, is more than just us at Parable Baptist Church, but it is a global church. It is a Catholic in the meaning of it takes over the whole globe church. It is uh, far reaching. It is far Spence, it is it's bigger than we could ever imagine. And so that Jesus took this time from chapter 11 to 18 to deal with just his disciples, preparing them to carry the church into the next generation. And that works because we are here meeting today because of that plan, because of Jesus delving and, and diving into his disciples' life and making them more like himself. We'll see in our text today that Jesus is operating in urgency. He is operating in the, the shadow of the cross. He knows that in just a few uh, days, in just a little while, in a few weeks, in a few months, he's going to be hanging on the cross. He's going to be dying for the sins of humanity. And with this task at hand, he gives much time pouring into these men. John, 1 through 4, John 11, 1 through 44, I want you to see today it can be divided in three different portions. And now I know that we know about the story of Lazarus, and I have heard Lazarus preached since probably my earliest memories. This is very familiar scripture. But what I have seen this week is that there is another way that I can, I can look at this and that we need to see it as a church, and I'm going to go at it with this mindset. I think there are three important divisions in this book, in this chapter. I think there are three things that we need to see that will help us understand what is going on in this world today and also what they were facing in this scripture. I want you to see first that Mary and Martha, because of their brother being sick, they had a plan. But how many of you understand that just because we have a plan doesn't mean that God is going to work out the way that we think that he should? But we see Mary and Martha, they have a plan. Then John tells us about Mary and Martha's pain. And finally, we will see that Jesus has the final word. And that's the title of my sermon today, because Jesus does have the final word. It doesn't matter what we're facing today. It doesn't matter what's on the news headlines. It doesn't matter what you're, you're, you're feeling. It doesn't matter the stress and the pain that you may go, be going through today. I want you to know that what you feel right now is not final. That Jesus Christ has the final say-so in the matters of our lives. That brings me great comfort. I don't know about you, but that makes me excited. That makes me full of joy to know that I don't have to figure it out. I don't have to have the plan. I don't have to work it out, but that God will do it for me. John 11 verse 1 says, Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany. He tells us Lazarus is the one who's sick. He lives in a village called Bethany, and that Mary and Martha are his sisters. Now, we don't see anything. The Bible doesn't tell us about his parents, uh, so they may be already passed on. They may have preceded them in death, but it tells us about Lazarus. It tells us about Mary and Martha, and it tells us that they live in Bethany. Now, as the text and the context will show us, as we will be looking through, we will find out that this family is a very prominent Jewish family. They had some sort of influence. I don't know if they had money or if they were just uh, well-connected in the Jewish leadership. I don't know anything about that. The Bible does not tell us, but it does tell us that they were prominent. And so we know that there is a small village two miles uh, from Jerusalem named Bethany, and that is where they are. Now, I want to remind you that Jerusalem is still a hotbed for Jesus. He just left Jerusalem in chapter 10 because he knew he was about to die. They were going to kill him. And so Jesus went to Judean wilderness to, for just a, a moment. But now he is coming. He's commissioned. He's called to come back. Verse 2 says, that it was this Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. Now, 
we don't know anything about this yet in this passage of Scripture. John does not tell us about this incident happening until chapter 12. But the reason he mentions it here is because a lot of his audience that was reading this book when he wrote it knew Mary by this sacrificial giving toward Jesus. Her reputation preceded her. So we know that this is the same Mary who anointed the feet of Jesus. Now, I want you to see that they had a problem. The, verse 3 tells us that they have a problem. The problem is that Lazarus, their dear beloved brother and beloved brother of Jesus, the prominent man in the Jewish culture of Jerusalem, is sick. So the sisters sent to Jesus. Their plan was, if we can tell Jesus that our brother is sick, then perhaps he will just speak the word and will heal him from where he is. How many of you know that Jesus can speak the word and all hell has to tremble? Jesus can speak the word and the world come into existence. Jesus can speak the word and a young man that is the son of a ruler can be healed just at Jesus saying, be healed. But for whatever reason, in this situation, Jesus does not do that. But they thought that he would. Verse 4. But when Jesus heard that this man was sick, he said, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now, when I got to this text this week, I realized I'm probably going to be in trouble because I don't know if I'm going to get past verse 4. But I'm going to do my best, and besides, what else have you got to do today anyway? Uh, but I, I'm going to, I want you to see this. Jesus says that this man's suffering and even his falling asleep, yes, he, he died, but he did not, it does not lead to death. It's not the end result. He died, but then he was, rose, uh, he was risen again. So Jesus is true he's, when he says he, he doesn't lead to death because it may have been a stopping point. But he, God raises him from the dead. But that this illness, the suffering that they're facing, the, the pain that Mary and Martha are feeling is for the glory of God. The reason that I had to stop this week and to spend some time in preparation right here is because, especially in this climate, there are preachers that are in some of the largest churches in this nation and that are on the television stations that you can turn on that will tell you that if you suffer, you don't have faith. They will tell you that suffering is not of God. They will tell you that if you are sick... It, you, it is because you do not have the faith to be healed. Brother, sister, those men and those women are false teachers. Those men and women are lying to you. And the reason that I know they are lying to you is because Jesus said so. Jesus said that this illness... All of the pain and the suffering that went with it, all of the, the fretting and all of the worry and the messenger sent to Jesus, all of this was for a purpose and that the purpose was the glory of God. So when you hear these preachers turn the channel, when you see these messages, these clips that sound good to your ears, pop up on your news feed, flip past it, call them out, call them to repentance, because what they're saying is damning people to hell. This is not popular preaching, but we call this the health and wealth of the prosperity gospel. These are lies that are from hell. Men like Frederick Casey Pierce, one of the fathers of the Word of Faith movement, said that if you are suffering, it is because you are stupid. Is that what Jesus said? He said if God is running everything, he does have things in a mess. Does that sound like what Jesus is saying to you? Another man, by the, he was famous and he is even still preaching today by the name of Kenneth Copeland. He says this, he says, suffering as simply an, an adversary who afflicts the ignorant. He says, like Job, we are the ones who bring about our own problems by the words that we speak. Kenneth Copeland says that because of the words that we speak, we suffer because we're ignorant. Is that the truth? Is that the gospel? No. 
It isn't. Uh, He says this. He says, God didn't allow the devil to get on Job. Now, we know that Job suffered immensely. The, the book of Job is, is, is wealth, uh, is full of his suffering and, and, and all kinds of information about suffering. And to, to this, he says this about Job and his suffering. He says, God did not allow the devil to get on Job. Job allowed the devil to get on Job. Is that what scripture says? Does scripture say that Job invited the suffering because of some of his sin? Read the book. The whole book is about not being that. As a matter of fact, God says that Job is a righteous man. He goes on to say, all God did was maintain his confession of faith about that man. He said that that man is upright in the earth. But Job himself said he was not upright in the earth. And he said, I'm miserable. These are words of Kenneth Copeland. When you see him flip the page. Scripture indicates that God did indeed allow Job to be afflicted. The Lord said to Satan, behold, all that he is in your power, only do not lay hand on this person. And the Lord said to Satan, behold, he is in your hand, but spare his life. That is Job chapter 1 verse 12, 2 and 6. Word of faith teachers are forced into misinterpreting Job's suffering. They say that there is no glory in knuckling down and enduring a trial. In other words, no one good whatsoever can come from suffering. Kenneth Hagin, another uh, father of the word of faith and false prophecy movement, says you cannot find anywhere in the Bible where God causes these things, these tragedies, to happen to teach his people something. To you, sir, I say you must repent because Jesus said you are wrong. Our suffering is for God's glory. Turn these people off. In word of faith theology, all believers should surely should thoroughly understand that their healing was consummated in Christ. I want you to realize, and I've been in a debate with someone recently about this. When Jesus came to this earth, he did not come to save you and heal you of all your infirmities. He came to save you and atone you. If he chooses to save you, bless God. Thank you for your mercy. But he didn't come to give you power just to heal your brother. He came to give you reconciliation with the Father. That's what salvation is about. Nothing more, nothing less. Because you are sick does not mean you're not saved. Because you are sick does not mean you don't have faith. Because you are sick means that God has a reason for your suffering and that God will glorify himself through it. Don't get misunderstanding. When these people come on, turn them off. Don't give them the clickbait that they want. Turn them off because they are false teachers. This is not popular. But these people must repent. Why? Because Jesus said so. Jesus said this Illness will bring glory to God. But they say, how can illness and death bring glory to God? And so we'll answer that question. I think the question has been the subject of the hour ever since Jesus said these things. But I believe and scripture teaches that our our suffering transforms us into the image of God. That's why we suffer. We become more like him as we become more dependent upon him. Our dependence on him leads to our resemblance of him. Let me say that again. Our dependence on God leads us to the resemblance of God. In great trials, the world will recognize the strength that you have in Christ. And it will become a gospel testimony. Our church has recently been through great suffering. At the loss of some of ours. But I can't tell you how many times I have heard that by the light that God has shown through this suffering, they can see the power of God in it. That's why we suffer. That's why Jesus said we suffer. Thirdly, our suffering ultimately increases our faith in Christ because we learn to trust in him. 
We learn to become like him. We learn to depend upon him. We learn to to look like Christ through this. That is the purpose of our suffering. If you don't believe me, open your Bible to any passage of Scripture, and it will tell you the same thing. It is not because of your lack of faith. It is because God is working a miracle through you and in you that he may be glorified. That's what this is all about. And I want you to realize this, this, this is an illustration that my grandfather, I have, I have his sermon, a lot of his sermon notes put together, and sometimes I sit down and I read through them. And then I find these little illustrations that he used, and they're absolutely golden, and this is one of them. There was a, a story of, of, an, a young, uh, of a young man one evening who was on a train ride, and he is going as part of this uh, train track. It goes around a mountain in a very steep cliff that when you look down the side of the cliff, you can tell that you're, there's nothing other than just a rickety old track under you. And this young man is looking out the window and looking down and thinking about how he is so close to his impending death. If this, if this train rocks just a little bit more to the left, what's going to happen to us? And so in his great fear and in, an, in his mindset of panic, he looks up and he looks around the train. And he's looking to see if anybody else is thinking the same thing he's thinking. But out of the corner of his eye, a young lady who is just a child is looking out the window in great amazement and awe. He looks at her face and in no means, in no way does he think that she is scared at all. And so he asks her, he says, young lady, do you not see the same things that I do? And she says, why, yes, it's beautiful, isn't it? And she said, he said, don't you worry about the fact that we could fall to our death? Why aren't you concerned? She said, I'm not concerned because I know that my daddy is driving this train. And that's the truth, brother, sister. When we are in suffering and when the train is shaken and then when our life is in balance and we, we don't know where God is coming from and when we're looking at our ill-brothered Lazarus and he looks like he's going to die, I don't want you to be afraid because I want you to know that our God is driving the train. We're not in this alone. We are in this together. We are suffering as saints. Yes, it looks unstable. Yes, it looks weird. Yes, it looks like we're going to fall. But our God... God is driving the train. There's nothing, no reason should we fear. That is the comfort that God gives us when we are suffering. Because we walk with Christ through so much, the good times and the bad, we learn that no matter how shaky the ride, it is not our faith that needs to shake. It is not our faith that gets us through. It is Christ who is driving the, 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 the train. Our, our faith should not be in our deliverance. Our faith should be in Christ and Him alone. Verse 5. I did make it through. Let's get to the next one. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Hold the phone. The Bible says that Jesus loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. So in my mind, if he loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, when he heard that he was sick, he would have left immediately. Or if, if, if he heard that he was sick, he would have just spoken the word. Because they obviously had enough faith to call him. But what does verse 6 say? Verse 6 says that so when they heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Now this is difficult, brother, sister. Because this is really close to home. Let me ask you a question. What do you do when God doesn't solve your problems like you think he should? What do you do when you're sincerely asking and trusting in God for a miracle? You do have faith, but God is silent. What do you do in those times? What, what if your plan is not God's plan? You see, Mary and Martha thought they had it figured out. Let me just tell Jesus, Jesus is going to say the word. And then now this fever is going to break. Now this suffering is going to be gone. But Jesus decided that in their pain, he was going to wait. 
What this text makes abundantly clear is sometimes God's love is best shown by His delay. Sometimes God's delay is the best way He can show us that He loves us. For the sake of you who are facing something today that, 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 and you may not wake up tomorrow, for those of us who are quarantined and preaching to an empty crowd, an empty church today, or, or sitting with their family and, and, and going through all of these things and don't know what tomorrow may hold, what the president or the governor may say, just because he doesn't fix it on day one doesn't mean God is not going to fix it at all. God's delay does not equal his denial. God's delay does not equal his denial. Jesus at this point had already determined with the Father that he would raise Lazarus from the dead. He already determined to work this out. Verse 7 says, then after this, he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea again. He was going to work a miracle, but he delayed in doing so. Don't be discouraged if God hasn't done it yet. Let's not forget that Jesus' disciples have been with him since nearly the beginning. And when Jesus said that he was going back to Judea, I want you to realize that the disciples were like, why in the world would he do this? Is he a glutton for punishment? Why is he going back to the, where the people want to kill him? But Jesus was on a mission. It might not have been when they thought it should have been, but Jesus was on a mission. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and you're going there again? But I want you to see the importance of Christ's obedience to the Father. Jesus answered, he said, are there not 12 hours in a day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. Jesus reminds us that the disciples have an urgency and an importance of, of obedience to the Father. He compares his timing to working during the daytime. And those of you who work outside know that it's very difficult to work at night. And in this culture, they, they didn't have the lights that we have. They didn't have the spotlights that you can put out on the road to do your work on the road. But they had the sun is their light. And so Jesus is saying that I'm, my ministry is only going to be so long and I'm living in an urgent place. I must obey God. Let me tell you, brother, sister, you are also in the same condition. While it is day, obey the call of God on your life. Share the good news of the gospel. Don't keep it hidden to yourself. Because we, like we've seen in the last couple of weeks, this whole world can be turned upside down by a virus. What's coming down the road? Let us be considerate. Let us be concerned to share the good news of the gospel while you still have time. That's why churches are still preaching. That's why pastors are preaching to empty pews this morning. Because the eternity is hot. For those who are lost without Jesus. And Jesus was operating under the same mindset. Jesus was operating under the same urgencies that we should, be, what we should be operating under. Our families that are lost and going to hell, you are the gospel to them. You share the gospel with them. You are the Bible they may not be reading. Your life is what they need to hear today and not tomorrow. Verse 11. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to waken him. And I love the disciples because they're almost like, sometimes they're like, I don't even get it. I, mean, I don't feel so bad about reading Scripture and not figuring it out because they didn't figure it out and they're looking at Jesus. And so they're like, hey, I, I, I don't get it. If he's asleep, why don't we just let, let, him, let him sleep? What's wrong with taking a nap? Right? And so the disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, I'm, I'm sure he'll wake up. He'll recover. Like, I've had naps that I didn't think I was going to wake up from. They were just that great. And they were probably thinking the same thing. Like, let the dude sleep. But now Jesus had spoken of death, but they thought that he was meaning taking rest and sleep. And then Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus has died. I love it when Jesus just dumbs it down, right? He just dumbs it down like, listen, dudes. And I can imagine him just kind of rubbing his head across his head, looking at the Father and like, really? These are the ones you, you gave me? But he says, they, they, he's dead, okay? But Jesus wanted to change their mindset. That he's getting the glory out of God. 
Jesus wanted to describe death as falling asleep because he was trying to change the disciples' perspective regarding death. Do you know we have no reason to fear death as Christians? We should be able to welcome death as Christians because that only means that we're going to heaven when we die. These disciples understood that death was their final foe, but Jesus was saying, I'm fixing to defeat death. You don't have to worry about death as final because I'm just saying it's a nap. Jesus sees death much differently. He understands death as much more than just a sleep, just nothing more than just sleep for, for a believer. Verse 15, and for your sake, I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Jesus right here summarizes everything I've been telling you up to this point. Jesus let Lazarus die for God's glory. Not only did he allow him to die for God's glory, but he also allowed him to die so that his disciples' faith would be increased in him. And so we see Jesus was glad that Lazarus was dead. Does that mean he was morbid? No, that means that he had training for his disciples to do. Verse 16, so Thomas called the twin said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. Now, I, how many of you remember watching Winnie the Pooh, right? I have a you know, couple here that, that, that are here, but I, I trust that you are too. Thomas is one of my favorite uh, disciples, but right here I can just imagine him as Eeyore. Right? Let us also go that we may die with him. He, he has faith in Jesus. He has faith that Jesus is going back. But he's like, okay, well, we're going to go back. And they're going to stone us. Not just Jesus, but they're going to stone all of us. Just let us go. That we may die with him. But then verse 17 has Jesus coming back into town. And so Jesus, he came and he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Do you think this was news to Jesus? Absolutely not. He knew where he was. But Bethany was near Jerusalem. About two miles off. And in the Jews, they come, and, the, and, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So, this is telling us that this is why I told you that they were a prominent family because they had a lot of Jews there. Now, this is a little bit of history information, but I think that you need to know. Jewish oral tradition says this it says that when anyone has a funeral, so even it didn't matter how, how poor you are. But say your grandfather or your aunt or your uncle or your child dies, and maybe you don't have anything. It's just you and him that's left. Now it's just, you're going to, you know, you, you, you're, he's now dead. Your livelihood is now gone. You are still required to hire two flute players to come and play for them and a professional mourning woman that was to come and to sit in your house with you and the flute players would play pretty tunes and sad tunes because this person has died. And the welling woman, oh, I can't believe they're gone. They don't even have to know them. But that was her full-time job. Constantly crying. And Can you imagine? I mean, like, this woman, surely she owns stocking Kleenex. Because this was her professional job. She probably only wore black clothes because that's all she ever did was go to funerals. That's if you're the poorest of the poor. Two flute players and one mourning, wailing woman. But now, this situation is different. The Bible tells us here that there were many Jews. So I'm sure if, it, if they did have to pay for people, there were a lot of people who still came out to their funeral. And there was a multitude of people there. So now I've showed you that their plan was to get Jesus to raise him while he was still sick. But we also see that Jesus allowed him to die for a purpose. So the next part of my sermon and of what the next section of this book is, Mary and Martha's pain. Now, I grew a lot in this portion of Scripture this week. Because as I really began to look at this, I, I, I saw some very, very profound truths here. And if you remember when I preached chapter 9, if you were here, you can go back and, and watch chapter 9, the first four verses, we see that Jesus sees a blind man. He sees a man who is disabled. 
and he goes out of his way to, to heal this blind man because of his disability. And I said that this is beautiful because the Bible is not silent on difficult situations. And in the same way, this is also beautiful because what we see here is how three different people suffer in their pain and how three different people suffer differently with their grief. And I've said this often here through this time at our church, but grieving is godly. Grieving is not sinful. Grieving and experiencing the pain of life is okay. It does not mean you don't have faith. It just means that you're hurting. And so we're going to look first at Martha and how she grieved. Then we're going to see how Mary grieved. And then the, the gospel of John was so beautiful to even show us how Jesus, the God-man, grieves. Now, Martha, first and foremost, I want you, you can go to Luke chapter 10 and you can see that Martha was a very type A personality. She was the one who uh, was OCD. She was the one who had it all figured out. She was the one who had to, this is the plan. I'm going to make a, a we're going to have a party two years from now. I'm going to go ahead and make the, 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 the guest list now. I'm going to plan out the, the menu. I'm going to go ahead and get the invitations for the party two years from now. And then I'm going to bug you every week before it happens on Facebook to make sure you're going to be there. This is Martha, okay? And that's okay. We're all different. You might be that person. Thank you, because I probably wouldn't have been there if you wouldn't have reminded me again. But, but other than that, this is Martha. Martha was anxious. Verse 41 of Luke chapter 10 says, Martha, Martha, you were anxious and troubled about many things. That's Jesus' words to Martha. So Martha was a type A person. And so when Martha, in verse 20, heard that Jesus was coming, she went to him. And she met him. And Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had not been here, or I'm sorry, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. And we see both doubt and faith right here. But I want you to notice, and what struck me in preparing this sermon today, or this week, is how Martha's hurting is manifest. And how timely this is for us. Because we all are hurting today. I'm hurting because I can't be with my church family. I'm hurting because our, our, our lives are upside down. I'm hurting because of the uncertainty in the time in which we're living. But how do I handle that? Martha handled it. She's hurting just like anyone else. But yet she is composed. She's not hysterical. Because of her type A personality, she's collected. She comes to Jesus. She walks to Jesus. She comes to Jesus composed and con collected. But I want you to see that she is still conflicted. Even though she looks like she's okay on the outside, she is conflicted on the inside because Jesus didn't do things her way. How many of you get upset when Jesus doesn't do it your way? We thought we had it figured out. Jesus, if you had been here, Lazarus wouldn't have died. There's nothing wrong with her reaction. She is grieving on her way. Isn't it wonderful how God is okay with our questions? Please don't miss Martha's faith, even though she's grieving. She says that if you had been here, but I know God hears you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said unto him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection of the last day. Martha even understood that there was a resurrection of the dead coming. But she missed seeing the full picture of Jesus. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who dies, believes in me, shall never die. Do you believe this? This is Jesus' question. Jesus once again says there's no fear to, of death for the believer. 
Jesus is recorded his fifth I am statement in the book of John. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus says her hope was in the resurrection that God gives. But it should be in Him, the giver of the resurrection and the life. Some of us, is your faith in the right place? Do you believe that God can because He is God? Or do you believe God can because you want Him to? Where is your faith? Verse 27. She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into this world. She makes the greatest, most wonderful confession uh, that men can ever make. She says, Jesus, you are the Christ. You are the one sent from God. You are the Son of God. You are the one who came into the world to redeem us. She said what every man and every woman, every knee will bow and confess, that Jesus Christ is the Word of, is the Lord. She confessed the right things. She has faith, but she's still grieving. Now I want you to see Mary. Mary, verse 28. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister and saying in private, The teacher is here and he is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and she went to him. She ran. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place before Mary and Martha. She ran out of town to get to Jesus. When the Jews who were with her and consoling her in the house, they saw Mary rise quickly and go out. They followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and she saw him, she fell at his feet, saying, Lord, if you had not been here, my brother would have died. Now consider Mary's response. Mary is not a type A personality. She is not collected and calm and controlled, yet conflicted. She is what I like to call a free spirit. She is not a strict rule follower. She's the type of person who goes with the flow. If I have to confess today, I'm more of a Mary than I am a Martha. I kind of lose it just a little bit. And so Mary, in her grief, she is distressed. She doesn't walk to Jesus. She runs to him. Her grief is disordered. She doesn't bother to tell anyone where she is going. She just jumps up, she runs, and she leaves. She is dismayed. She says, if you, do, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. This is the same question that Martha asked, but Mary doesn't make the same statement of faith that Martha did. Does this mean Mary doesn't have faith? Absolutely not. She just grieves differently. And that's what I need you to see today. Just because you are overwhelmed does not mean God is not in you. Just because you're overwhelmed, just because you're stressing, just because you're having trouble with all these NTI paperwork doesn't mean you have any less of God this week than you did last week. And I know all of your mothers just said, Amen. God is still God. God is still real. He is still in control. And Mary, even though she was freaking out, she knew this. But finally, I want you to see how Jesus grieves. Aren't you thankful that John tells us this? Aren't you thankful that we know that our grief breaks Jesus' heart? Aren't you, know, aren't you glad to know that while we weep, Jesus weeps for us? When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her were also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and he was greatly troubled. Now I learned something this week about this word deeply, these words deeply moved. I'd always thought that this was maybe Jesus grieving just like they were, but what I realized is I was wrong. The word for Greek, uh, the word from the Greek translated deeply moved doesn't suggest that Jesus was hurting because Lazarus had died. Remember, he, he already knew he was going to raise him up. But the Greek actually suggests that Jesus was moved to anger and even outrage at the situation. So Mary is hurting, Martha is hurting, and Jesus is angry. Why is he angry? Why would Jesus be angry at what he saw? It is likely that Jesus was angry because of the unbelief of some of the people there. That's, that's possible. But I think it's more likely that Jesus was upset that death was even in the equation at all. If you remember back to the beginning in the Garden of Eden, man was not supposed to die. Adam and Eve were supposed to live forever and have kids and have grandchildren, and they would still be alive today doing NTI packets. 
But that's not the case. Because we, Adam and Eve fell. And how many remember that Romans 6.23 says that the wages of sin is death. And so when Jesus walked into the town and he sees the family members of his friend, what angers him is the fact that we are sinful to begin with. The fact that it's not supposed to be this way. We shouldn't have to worry about our grave plot. We should be worried about the next group of great, 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 great grandkids we're fixing to have. That's the plan of God in the beginning. But we screwed all that up and that angers Jesus. Verse 34, and he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. And so Jesus wept. I remember being in Sunday school. That was my favorite verse to memorize. John eleven thirty five. 35, Jesus wept. I want to challenge you today to go home and remember, or to sit there at the house and memorize that verse. Jesus wept. Because of his grief, his grief and his anger at the situation, Jesus wept. Don't forget, we should be grieving. But we shouldn't be grieving as those who have no hope. 1 Thessalonians 4.13 tells us, We are not pagans. We are not without Christ. We should realize that those who die in Christ have hope in Christ because they have heaven to gain. And Jesus is the resurrection and the life. I'm going to move quickly. So the Jews said, So, so how he loved, see how he loved him? Could not he have opened the eyes of the blind also? Kept, kept, could, he, could not he who opened the, blind of the, eyes, the eyes, eyes of the blind man not have also kept this man from dying? So we have confessions that Jesus did that. Could he have not done this? And so finally, I want to I tell you that Jesus has power over the death. And Jesus has the final word. Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave. Stone laid against it. I want you to see this because this is important as I fix to close this sermon. Stick with me just a few more moments. In this time frame, a grave was more than nothing more than a rock with a hole carved out in it. Inside that grave, if you were prominent enough to be buried and wasn't buried in a potter's field, you, were, you walk inside this hole in the ground, or you crawl inside this hole in the ground, and there's a bench for weeping and preparation of the dead. And then around this hole would be various other dead people who had been dead for a long time. It is very possible that in this room, Lazarus' mother and father, and maybe grandfather, grandmother, were buried already in this hole, and Lazarus was simply added to it. I also want you to know that in this process of burying the dead, similar to what you see in a movie that Egyptians do, they would wrap their dead in linen, but it was very different all at the same time. How a dead person was buried as a Jew was they would cut a, a sheet of linen that was two times the length of that person. They would put his feet at the bottom of one of the of that sheet, and the rest of it would be towards his head. And once they have put spices across the body to make it smell a little bit better, as you walked by this hole with a stone in front of it, still it stunk. But as you walked by, the spices would help with the decomposition smell. They would take the remainder of the top of that sheet and they would cover it over their body. And they would tie the, they would use linen uh, strips and would tie around his feet loosely. And they would tie it loosely around his arms so that would keep it all down and the spices around the skin of the person. Now I tell you all this so that way it makes sense for the remainder of what I say. Jesus came and he said, take away the stone. So there's a stone in front of this hole and, and, and Lazarus is inside and he's been decomposing. And Martha, the type A sister, says, Lord, by this time, There will be an odor, for he has been dead for four days. Okay, so you're going to ask God for a miracle, then you're going to tell him how to do it? Don't we do the same thing? God, give me more time with my kids, and then you get fired. God, give me more time with my kids, and then you get coronavirus. have to do NTI packets. God, he may answer your prayer in a totally different way than what you think he will. 
But Jesus, I'm, I'm glad he didn't get upset with her and turn around and walk away. Well, I'm not doing it at all if I'm not, if I'm not doing it the way you want it to be done. And Jesus said in her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? As Christians, it should be our default position to pray that God would work on his behalf, not ours. But the reason this is not our default position is because this is the hardest. God, fix it my way or the highway. That's not how we should pray. We should say, we should say God, fix it any way that when the world sees it, they say that God did it. That's where the miracle lies. And I can speak from personal experience when I can say that I'm thankful that God doesn't do things my way. I'm glad it didn't work out the way I thought it was supposed to be. I'm glad it didn't work out the way I put my efforts behind. I'm glad that God hijacked my plan and did it His way. Remember, God has promised to work out all things for our good. That doesn't mean that it's, it's our good because we think it is. It's our good because it's His good for us. What we think we might want just might destroy us. Trust God's sovereignty. Verse 41. So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes, and he said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on the account of the people standing around, that they may believe you sent me. Then I want you to see he's... he's displaying his unique relationship with the Father, and he's displaying that he's totally dependent on the Father's will. But verse 43 says this. He says, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Do you realize if Jesus wouldn't have said Lazarus, every dead man on the planet would have come out when Jesus said come out? Have you ever thought about that? Jesus had the power to cause it. Moses. We looked up and there's Moses standing in front of him. You've been dead for centuries. What are you doing here? Well, Jesus said, come out. Right? That could have happened. But Jesus said, Lazarus, come out. In verse 44, the man who had died come out and his hands and his feet were bound in lithers, and linen strips and his face was wrapped in a cloth. But Jesus said to him, unbind him and let him go. He hobbled out. He jumped out. But Jesus set him free. So in conclusion today, I'm fixing to pray. I want to say thank you to those of you who have stuck with me throughout this sermon, however long this has been. We have seen that Christians, as Christians, there are times we have a plan. But God doesn't work according to our plan. He will work according to the situations for his good as he sees fit, not us. Secondly, we have seen that grieving is good and grieving is godly. We all grieve differently and that is also okay. Thirdly, we have seen that death is not final and that Jesus has the final word. And that when we die, Christ is our reward. Brother, sister, aren't you thankful that you don't have the final word, but that, that Jesus does? I want to pray for us as I close this thing down, because I know that we have a lot of uncertainty in our lives. But in the midst of this certainty, uncertainty, God has given us the certainty of his scripture. He foreordained you seeing this sermon right now in the midst of the things you're facing. Don't take it as a rebuke from God. But take it as a plan of God to make you more like him. Master, Heavenly Father. I want to thank you for how I felt you to preach today to this practically empty room. Just as if there were 7,000 present. I pray that you use this sermon in its digital form. I know it's no substitute for gathering together and the presence of God we feel in the room as we hear it. But I still pray that you work it for your good. I pray that you pl use pliable hearts. You have made fallow ground in the hearts of the hearers and that they come to Christ because of you. 
I pray that you do the work and remove my fingerprints. And Father, I thank you for this. In Jesus' name we pray. May God bless.